Gregory, why don't we begin to talk a little bit about the concept of the of the sun then in terms of your new book that you have out now. Um, what got you interested in, in looking at the sun? Uh, as I understand it, obviously, you're looking at this from a point of view that the sun actually is a conscious uh, being. But overall, people who listen to this program will be aware that the sun is, is something we've been focusing on now because it's, it is starting to get a different behavior, uh, if you know what I mean. It, it, it's, we're waiting for a storm, a sunstorm, something to happen on the sun. Uh, but w- what got you interested in, in, uh, in this uh, theory, uh, Gregory? Well, I, I recognized back when I was 18 years old in Berkeley, California, um, I had this sort of epiphany moment where I recognized that the sun was not some dead ball of gas, that there was a living being there. Um, I never did anything with it, though. I never really talked about it, except when people started talking about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And I couldn't restrain myself from pointing out all this technology and you know, things going on whilst we're oblivious to the smartest thing in our little nook, nook of the woods, which is our sun. But I, as, as I said, I never really did anything with it. I ran quite a few businesses involved with natural foods, and I opened a shop related to, dedicated to chaos theory. Um, I wrote my first book. And then as I was beginning work on my second book, I, I sort of honed it down to a, a chosen sort of subject I wanted to write about, but I got into topic drip and I drift. And I started writing about the sun and about the fact that not primitive people, but ancient people, you know, very civilized people, pre-Christianity, all saw the sun as a living being. And I went off on that tangent and I suddenly realized, well, this is actually the stone I want to uncover, the biggest elephant in the room. And um, and a very important book to write because I've always liked doing things that are quite new to the culture, but obvious once you give them a little bit of thought. Mm. My first one was the the relationship between diet and health. Because in 1967, when you told people that what you ate affected your health, they looked at you like you were a nutter. You know, where's this guy coming from? Um, now people say, well, of course, what do you mean? <laughs> right. But there was about, you know, 15, 20 years of work changing that that attitude. <laughs> Well, isn't that always uh, what it what it's about? Someone need to spearhead and and uh, break through the ice, so to speak, and bring new ideas to the to the surface. That has always been the case, right? That's right. Yeah, um, and it's always been you know, not accepted at the beginning. Whatever whatever the sort of established theory is, it it meets ridicule at first because that's how we treat unfamiliar things generally. Absolutely. Uh, so how how did you go about? Um, tackling this 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 issue, this topic, uh, did you come to it from a point of view that okay, I need to actually prove scientifically that the sun is alive, or or, or is it enough, so to speak, to to uh, approach the topic from the point of view of uh, of how the the ancient people viewed the sun and, and how and their relationship uh, to the sun? Yeah, well, I suppose I, I call myself a bootstrap philosopher. Um, I'm not a scientist. But I, in the course of writing the book, I looked into the science of it quite a bit. And, you know, the first thing we have to recognize is that it wasn't science that told us sun worship is primitive and ignorant. It was the church, and, and the church burned people who disagreed with them for, for many centuries. And that has a, you know, a very strong shaping impact on the culture. And um, so I'm kind of rewind back to a point before the Old Testament was sort of mandated in in the 4th century AD mm. and um and look at the you know look at the sun look at solar science from the viewpoint of somebody who recognizes or thinks that the sun is a living being and it it just so much of what we know about the sun today fits with that and when you understand the complexity of that um, of the sun and, and of stars in general, I mean the sun itself has seven different layers inside the sun. Some of the layers turn at different speeds to each other. It's got a magnetic field, the corona, that's much bigger than itself. 
It has a magnetic field, the heliosphere, that embraces all the planets, protects them from being blown apart eventually by high impact cosmic, high energy cosmic rays. Um, it interacts with all those planets. There are auroras on every planet in the solar system when the sun's magnetic field meets theirs. And as you sort of, I'm going to go into that more later on, but when you stack all this up and you say, well, okay, now clean, clean head slate, is this a, uh, pointless bowl of gas that we, we happen to be benefiting from? Or is it some, is it a life form that is actually playing a part in shaping and managing the environment around it? And, you know, the more likely choice is the latter one, that it's, that it is a living being. And, um, the unlikely one is that this is all just a, a bowl of gas. Hmm. So what do you think the, how how would you explain the consciousness itself of of the sun? Is it is it um, is it as a human being is consciousness in that sense that it is uh, rapid in that sense we we can see time progress and and things like that or is it is it on another level? It's maybe of a, a type of consciousness that we would have very difficult to 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 understand. Maybe it's it's um, it's slower in one sense. I mean we can even if we look at uh, some of the things that NASA has released. Uh, some of these audio signals that they speed up, you can almost hear planets uh, emit sounds, almost like waves, actually. But these are very extremely low frequencies. So you, actually, if you compress it or speed it up, rather, you can hear it's like whale song, similar to their sounds like they actually are communicating, if you will. Uh, yes. And, yeah. and that, that's the idea that I guess I, I can apply to the sun as well. It seems like that's the, the big kahuna in the, in the solar system, obviously, and, and that might be the the daddy of, of it all, and actually are, are, are um, conducting this little orchestra, if you will. How, how do you view that, Gregory? Well, well just on, on the sound thing, I was recently at a, oh, last weekend, a, a scientific Royal Society 350th anniversary show in London, and I was on the, I went to this one stand, which was Sounds of the Stars, and I was listening to all these different sounds from different stars. Everyone's got its own little note, um, or, or tune that it plays, if you like, and they haven't, you know, manip- they've, they've changed the scales, but they've been true to it, so that, I mean, if they're doing the same thing to a familiar tune that you knew, you would recognize the tune, it would just be at a different scale. Yeah. Um, but when you're asking about consciousness of the sun, how it compares to human consciousness, I'm going to have to point out that human consciousness is the most mysterious aspect that there is of being a human being. It's the least understood part of our humanity. And some scientists, I mean, quite a few, in fact, regard consciousness as an illusion of the brain yeah, and, and not actually a real thing. Um, and there's debate over we, whether, whether we really have free will or whether everything we do is was predicated by the arrangement of particles at the Big Bang, which I, I, I've actually had conversations with intelligent scientists who believe that that whole conversation was predicated by by the Big Bang, because otherwise you have to accept free will. Um, so it is a mysterious thing, but but one thing we do know is that it's it's invisible. It's it's an energy field. And perhaps our our brain is creating it, or perhaps our brain is the tool through which this energy field affects and interacts with you know, the, our environment, with, with, with mm. that that's around it. Mm. Um, but it is an invisible energy field. And when you look at the sun, its corona is you know, stretches several million kilometers out into space, occupies more space than the sun itself. It's a very, it's what's described by scientists as the most mysterious aspect of the sun. And yet, the same solar scientists believe that the corona manages or controls the sunspots, coronal filaments, coronal mass ejections, and solar flares, which are the four sort of variable and unpredictable aspects of the sun's behavior. Much of it is is sort of standard behavior, but those the sunspots come in cycles, the activity comes in cycles, but we can never really you know, predict it. 
Um, so, so, so at the one hand, they're saying the corona manages all this stuff. And at the other, they're saying it's the most mysterious part of the sun. Mm. And it is this invisible energy field. Mm. Um, so, you know, that could be where the consciousness of the sun is doing its thing. Uh, it's. Uh, I want to talk more about uh, sunspots and, the, and these uh, kind of unknown variables that we can see a little bit later as well. But do you think that humans then, and, and even maybe human consciousness, is a is a product of the sun? If the sun is protecting us, so to speak, with its with its uh, corona, we obviously wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that fact. But but do you think that we may, might even be a product of the sun? Well, you know, we we talk a lot about. You know, the benefits of solar energy to, to power our light bulbs and our cars and heaven knows what. But but we are. I mean, the energy with which you and I experience and, and all of your listeners experience our existence is pure recycled solar energy. It's concentrated in plants through photosynthesis. Um, and whether we eat those plants or whether we eat animals that eat those plants – that energy is solar energy, which we are recycling. Mm. Um, and we're recycling in thought. We're recycling it in action. So um, that's a sort of direct linear sense that our consciousness is dependent on the sun. And, 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 I, and I believe that if we were on a spaceship and we traveled light years away from the sun, we would not lose our consciousness, but we would still be feeding it with stored solar energy. That's interesting. I've I've heard stories about that too, and the the idea there that if we if we leave this um, if we leave our own solar system, uh, that we, we are actually so deeply connected to it that we would um, in one way, if you will, lose our lose our minds. We would lose our connection to ourselves in that sense. It I guess it's a theory about the fact that within the magnetic field of the sun, and consequently, I think even of the Earth. Uh, our consciousness is very, very bound to that. So maybe we can't even penetrate outside of that. We would not. We would stop to function actually in one way, or brain activity would stop to function. Uh, I don't know if there's any scientific proof for that yet, because as far as I know, any humans haven't been outside of of the corona of the of the sun. But uh, <laughs> any theories on that, Gregory? Um, just that you know, there's only one way to find out, I guess. <laughs> Try it, huh? But uh, yeah, I don't really know. Uh, I, I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, um, what if we talk about, I guess, a little bit more in terms of what the sun actually is then? Uh, one weird thing to me is when we see um, sunspots on the surface, it's uh, it's it's black inside, right? It's it's, it's right. It, it, it looks like it's hollow. Some people have suggested even that it, it is a black hole. The only thing is that we see the effect of, of, uh, of the energy that is being... Uh, either pushed through, it might be an implosion or an explosion, d- depending on how we want to look at it. But there's so many theories out there in terms of the electric universe that it's kind of a, like a discharge, even um, like a, like a node point, but or a dipole. But what's your take on that? What 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 is the sun then? Um, what are sunspots? You mean sunspot? Or, we, we can talk about that too. But but the fact that even uh, even we see, we can see a black uh, a black hole when we have these sunspots when these okay. When it's opening up, it's it's uh, it's no light inside, right? Well, it's about it's a well, it's not a it's not a black hole. It's not black. It's just it's darker than the surrounding area. But it's about you know fifteen hundred degrees or twelve hundred degrees um, cooler yeah. than the than the surrounding area, which makes it um, you know less bright. But it is um, it's a magnetic field coming up from inside the sun, which is coming out through the surface at that point. But it's, you know, what that magnetic field is and what its function is has been a mystery since um, Galileo noticed them in the 17th century, and we've been keeping track of them ever since. Chinese astronomers noticed them B.C. Um, But it's it's part of the function of of the sun. It's what, what... particular function it provides, why they come in the sort of 11, 22 and 80 year, 88 year cycles mm. um, is a mystery. And I believe that if, if solar scientists were to take on board the idea of a conscious sun, they might be able to put, put a few more things together, but it is a, it's a very different level from what we're experiencing. And, you know, some of that people ask me and, um, 
preempt you from asking me, what do you think the suns and stars think? Mm. It's kind of like, you know, one of the might be kind of like one of the bacteria in our intestines trying to figure out what we're thinking about and what we're talking about <laughs> in terms of levels of consciousness. You could fit a million Earths in the sun. So it's, 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 it's massive. And, and, but what about the, the interaction between humans and the sun then in that sense? It seems also obviously that our, uh, our, our entire being and our consciousness is, is linked to it in, in, in that sense. But do you think that uh, in some sense we could communicate or interact w- w- with the sun as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, some of the ancient monuments, I mean, the most, well, the most enduring monuments from ancient times were... Of, you know, we're pretty sure tied into the sun and, and other stars. And I see them as, you know, as much communication technology as sort of a monuments to honor something because they were very specifically built and designed, whether it's to communicate with the sun or to channel energies from it into our land and our psyche. Um, because it was, it is the intuitive, it is the natural headset to see the sun as a living being. And even though, you know, a lot of people are sort of mention this to you know, people think it's a really strange idea today. What, what's really strange is that people think it's a strange idea because it is the, the natural viewpoint. And with that viewpoint, people used to extend extend their connection with the sun in different ways and, and have a greater sensitivity to light than we have. I mean, we know that light's the most efficient medium there is for carrying information. Right. Um, but we have to get it through a telescope and we take the telescope through a spectrum. You know, we, we examine the spectrum of it and determine how many chemicals there are in the different stars, whether it's, you know, 1% iron or how much percent carbon. Um, and we do all of that, but we never actually use our eyes to look and say, hey, what's this light telling me? And people must have done that in the past. Um, I mean, they realized that Jupiter was the king of the planets. Mm. And yet you look in the sky and Venus is usually bigger than Jupiter. Um, that information is coming with the light and we've lost the ability or the, the, the skill of, of picking it up. But if you were spending many nights of your life looking at the stars because that's your particular interest and there weren't, wasn't a, weren't a lot of diversions in those days of, I mean, nor light pollution, um, who knows what information you get as you tune into it, just as a sportsman tunes into his muscles or an artist tunes into his palate, you get better at things. Mm. But we, you know, since we sort of view all this as dead, uninteresting stuff, and since we've developed great technology to do the job for us, you know, whole areas of it have been lost, I think. Do you think it could be, I hear this about cellular programming in terms of all living beings that, we receive information from the white noise out there in space. We, this could be this could be viewed as cosmic radiation. It could be radiation from the sun, etc. But, but in one way or another, it could be an interpretation of that. It could be that we are literally being being programmed, and even evolution itself might actually be driven by an external force like the sun or, or another source in the universe. And so, if we are shielded off from that or cut off from that, maybe we're we're losing the the upgrade, if you will, slowly as well. What do you think about that? I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I just on on the more general level with the the sun and, and our world, the wind and the trees and the grass and the rivers and the rocks. You know that's part of our world. That's part of our vibrational field. And when we lose touch with that and and live in indoors and go to your car and go indoors and get in the get in the sort of tube or a train or a bus and get in a plane and go to a terminal, you know, people can spend their whole lives without connecting with the world, with the stars, with the sun. And I think we lose an awful lot of our, 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 our evolution, our humanity by doing that. Absolutely. And, and I mean, what you mentioned earlier is a good point as well. These days we don't 
we don't look up at the stars. We we humanity has created their own, and we sit and look at the stars on the TV now or on the movie well, screen or what have you. And uh, if, we're we're losing that story as well of the stars, the mythology of the stars. Now, even astronomers don't look at the stars. That's right. They, they look they look at it on computer screens. Yeah. And not even they don't even have a sort of direct through the telescope looking anymore. It's all done through computers. That's pretty pretty sad in that way. And uh, um, what 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 can you say in terms of the ancients and their relationship as well unto the sun? We have obviously these stories coming down to us today about even actually you know ritual sacrifice to the sun because of a fear that it might go out. We we hear about um, v- various um, I guess incarnations of the sun. Don't know how to put that. But they, they believe the Mayans, for instance, and other uh, people of, of the South American continent that oh. the sun had lived through the first, the second, the third, and fourth cycles of forth. Now I think we're moving into the fifth, or maybe it's into the sixth now. I can't uh, remember that exactly. And in one way, they, it was like they were linked with the sun, and it was almost like it was their responsibility to keep it, uh, keep it going, uh, fuel it, if you will. Well, on the sacrifice thing... Um I was delighted to, to find out in the course of writing my book that um, the Aztecs originally sacrificed, sacrificed fruit and flowers to the sun. Um, and I suspect that the human sacrifice side of it, the sun needs human bodies to keep going or human souls to keep going, was possibly an, uh, the ancient equivalent of you know, what we have today, which is you know, weapons of mass destruction. Right. Um, a good reason to go out, create fear, oppression, conquer other nations because you need hearts for the sun. Um, just like we had to like get rid of weapons, WMDs that didn't exist, or we want to bring democracy to these poor people and you know spare them from tyrants. And I mean, the early conquistadores going from Spain, going to to Central America, they were bringing them Christianity and taking their gold in return. Hmm. Um, and, you know, obviously the sun doesn't need people being sacrificed to it, but at that point it served political and religious purposes. Um, the cycles of the sun, I wouldn't see as incarnations of the sun, but I, I read a fascinating book um called The Lost Star of Myth and Time by Walter Cruttenden. Yes. And that um, explained those, those processionary cycles of the sun in terms of its relationship to Sirius, because the vast majority of stars have a partner, um, and they travel with their partner through the, un- through, through the galaxy, um, spinning around each other like a couple of figure skaters. And... You know, it's been thought that the sun doesn't have a partner star. As, as astronomers, they romantically call this a binary system. Mm. Um, but most stars are in a binary system. And according to, to this book, Sirius is our partner star. And as the two stars travel through each other, as we see through the entire, we, we, we see the whole constellations rotate at that, during that cycle, um, we get the different ages, which have, according to the ancients and according to Walter Cruttenton, a very pronounced effect upon our human evolution, our feelings, our spirituality. I mean, the Romans knew they were living in a, in a dark period, and they acknowledged that, and um, that was perhaps why they had such bizarre forms of entertainment. <laughs> That's right. And uh, for th- for those who are curious, by the way, I want to know more about that. We have a two-hour interview with uh, Walter as well. For those who are interested, and and that's a really interesting theory in terms of what he presents there. And and but but do you then see this connection? Do, would you agree with that? That connection to Sirius specifically. Other people are talking about simply that we might have a brown dwarf, a a cold star, I guess, inside of our own solar system as as a companion. But we have actually not spotted that one yet. What do you think, Gregory? Well, that's a possibility, but. I, I read through Walter's book. By the way, is that is that a coming up or is that in the can? That it's is? Uh, it's in the can. It's in the archives, as it were. Yeah. But but I've read through his book and it thoroughly convinced me. He's done quite a good job of it, and it also ties in with you know earlier civilizations, you know, Egyptians and others 
recognition of Sirius as a special as a special star. Mm. And so much of the knowledge of the ancient world has been consciously, methodically destroyed. Um, I mean, when we tend to forget that for a thousand or more years, there were scholars who were studying irrigation and astronomy and astrology and chemistry and healing. And they built up, you know, a lot of information and study on that. And, and it was sp- consciously destroyed in the fourth, most of it, in the vast majority of it in the fourth century because it was pagan and the Christians wanted to get rid of everything that was pagan. It was a sort of the Pol Pot headset. And, um, you know, the library of Alexandria was burned to the ground or destroyed. And, you know, we, we wonder how they built the pyramids. There was probably a manual in the library of Alexandria telling you how to build pyramids. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, I believe they, they had a lot of knowledge of Sirius and, the relationship of our sun to other stars and, and the importance of light, but, but the vast majority of it is lost. I mean, what little bit was salvaged for, of Greek knowledge by the, by the Arabs um, formed the basis of the, 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 the Enlightenment. Um, you know, it brought us out of the Dark Ages in, in, in Europe, just, just a little bit of what survived. And we don't know what's lost. Um, I mean, we may have rediscovered some of it already. Who knows? That's right. Uh, and and there might be uh, more to discover, as it were, in terms of uh, both underneath the pyramids and uh, around the Sphinx area. There are stories going around, of course, but we'll we'll see what happens on that front. Uh, yeah, the labyrinth. I'm, I'm fascinated with the, the whole concept of the labyrinth, what might be in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so what do you think in terms of the... We we talked about Sirius a little bit. That's obviously another star out there. Then, do do you think that our sun is special in in any way in that sense, or do you think that this is the case in terms of the consciousness of this of our star? Is that the case for every every single star out there? Do you think? Well, I think undoubtedly, I think stars were the first the first consciousness or life, possibly the first life form in the universe. And I mean, we. We've been here, you know, if the universe were 100 years old, we've been here for a week. Um, and we always sort of recognize stars as being conscious. And we've sort of, you know, eight minutes ago in that week, relatively speaking, the Old Testament headset came in and said, no, we're the only thing that's conscious, you know, us and God, nothing in between. Mm. And I just think it's, it's incredibly arrogant for you know considering how little we know about consciousness to think that we know enough to know that nothing else experiences it except us and possibly some aliens with three eyes and four legs you know right <laughs> um, kind of like us um when you know it's it's quite it seems once you live with the idea for a while it's pretty obvious that stars are conscious and they're sending signals out messages out to each other constantly. They're connected by um, magnetic field lines that, you know, stretch across, across interstellar space. And from galaxy to galaxy, there are these sort of magnetic fields in action. Um, I mean, there's a magnetic portal directly connecting the sun to earth that is, um, you know, that I found out about on a NASA website. And every every eight minutes, tons of charged particles pass back and forth between the sun and Earth through this specific portal. Mm-hmm. Um, That's fascinating. I never heard that before. No, I can send you a link if you give me. Well, that would be great for our listeners as well. I can check up on that. We can li- link that up on on the info page for the radio show. And so, sure. what what is this magnetic? Uh, what, have they discovered what the what the function is, or why this exchange of energy is, is taking place? No, not at all. And as long as they regard the sun, the sun as an accidental ball of gas, they probably won't. <laughs> uh, but it's, I mean, there are, you know, the sun's 93 million miles away, and there are sort of magnetic field lines coming off the, um, the corona that, that just are uninterrupted travel to the Earth mm. and connect to the Earth. I mean, this is all sort of NASA stuff. I'm, I mean, as I was 
as I was writing this book, it was you know twenty percent of what I wanted to write about was was already in my head, but the rest of it was an amazing voyage of discovery and when I looked into the science of it, it just became more and more mystifying why the scientists don't make this jump. But it's it's maybe kind of like trying to convince a girl who was brought up in a convent that there's nothing wrong with sex. So what do you think in terms of human activity and, and the sun responding to that? Um, that? That's another theory as well, of course. I've heard... Wilhelm Reich talked about orgone energy and the relationship about between human consciousness and how we even can influence and drive the weather. And I think that it might even be a, a higher, bigger version of that where we might actually have, um, I'm talking now not maybe indiv- an individual consciousness, but humanity as a whole, our collective consciousness, that we might actually influence uh, the sun in terms of its own activity, solar flares or CMEs or, 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 or that kind of relationship. Uh, what's your take on that? Um, I think that's a, that's a strong possibility that we are able to have an effect. Um, again, earlier earlier civilizations took that on board, and they had sort of practices to induce rain or get or get trees to harvest. I mean, they were much more aware of the interconnectedness of everything. And you've got I might find it confusing that. Science is having studied chaos theory a lot and, and fully understanding the the sort of butterfly affecting the weather concept. Mm. Um, but they cannot accept that, you know, all sorts of other levels this might be happening too, like on an astrological level. I mean, the moon can lift up the oceans. Yeah. The sun holds the planets in tow. And yet, you know, you're not allowed to su- su- suggest that they might affect the brain of a of a fetus, which is a little bit more delicate than you know than lifting oceans. Um, so, so yeah, there's a, there's a connection of whether the sun is. Um, I mean, well, it's definitely the the driving force behind weather on Earth. Yes, of course. Nothing, nothing has a greater influence upon our weather than the sun. And yet, uh, you know, it's not often thought of on the global warming side. It's totally excluded, as far as I I hear. Mm-hmm. And that's a big mistake to make. Obviously, again, we just think of the vastness and the, again, the incredible energy that that <laughs> that the sun holds. And because uh, we we know that other kinds of effects are going on on other planets around the solar system as well. So we should call it. Uh, solar system warming, not global warming, actually, because it's happening on, on other planets. Yeah, ex- exactly. I'm, I'm, tr- I'm trying to track down where I read about that. But yeah, Earth is not the only place that's changing dramatically. And I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, what about other things then in terms of th- that incredible amount of energy must have other effects also on on the Earth, uh, not only weather-wise, but I, I hear stories about earthquakes and, and volcanoes that uh, um, that the, the pressure so to speak of, of the planet is regulated by the by the sun as well and, and we can get uh, earthquakes and, and, and volcanoes as an effect of this depending on if it's a high activity on the sun or not uh, have you heard about that Greg I've heard it discussed and I was at a uh, I was at a s- astronomy lecture a few months ago with a, a friend of mine who puts on solar eclipse parties as it, as it happens. And um, there was Liz Green, an astronomer, who was giving the lecture. And I asked, the, I put the question, because uh, she studied magnetic fields particularly around the sun. And I put the question that, you know, did she ever consider that it might be a conscious entity, bearing in mind the nature of its activities? And she actually said that's, Maybe, she said, maybe we're missing the big picture when we're sort of up to our ears and our sort of specializations. Mm-hmm. Um, but my friend asked about whether there had recently been the earthquake, um, it was either the Haiti earthquake or the one right after it. Um, and, but there had been a CME three days before that, and he asked whether there was a connection between the two. 
Um, and she she said not she she said it wasn't possible, but you know that yeah. But she was um, she was open minded to the idea of the sun being conscious, but not to the fact that it, the CME might have affected an earthquake. Um, mm-hmm. But again, you know, she's only looking at one particular field of it. She just didn't think the energies involved in that would have been sufficient to create that effect. But if they were you know, directly targeting magnetic fields of the Earth and working with them rather than just a sort of random energy field coming here, yeah, perhaps it perhaps it does have that that impact. I, I believe so. And uh, so, what 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 do you think is going on uh, with the sun right now? Then we we hear stories from from NASA and other sources as well. They're talking about uh, it, that it's unusually quiet right now as well. Uh, they're waiting for the next cycle or, or sun. Um, you know, there's fewer but, sunspots than expected right now. Yeah, the uh, next the maximum is overdue. Yeah, indeed. What, and, do, you, what uh, do you think is going on there, then? Well, the re- the information I read about it is sort of two com- or pulls apart. One is on one side they're saying what's happening to the sun, why is it so inactive, and on the other side we're getting predictions of massive solar activity coming in in the next year or two, and I'm not quite sure whether they just think it's going to be massive because it's been inactive for a while or 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 whether there's any actual indications or clues to say that is happening i mean there's the talk of the magnetic pole shifting on the sun and affecting the poles on earth as well mm-hmm. um, i don't really know what the the underlying cause of that is. I mean, it's, on a trivial level, it could be as simple as a, a woman being a few days late with her period, um, or it could be something really cosmic that is going to change life as we know it on this planet. Well, I mean, that's true. I mean, it, it, the sun can sneeze, you know, and, and, and all our satellite might go, might, might go down, and if it coughs, we might all even vanish. That's, yeah. uh, that's what we're talking about yeah, here, yeah, the it, amount it, it, of energy. I mean, I've I've heard these you know, horror stories from people about what could happen to our technology, but that's, you know, that's not the sun's fault or intention. I mean, it, it as you say, it belches, and if it's headed this way, you know, we've got all this new technology that's never been exposed to a belch before, so so we belch before. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, maybe that will uh, get us to look up at the stars once again, then, huh? Well, it's, it's it's got a few more satellites up there looking at the sun, trying to figure out ways to predict the CME so that we can sort of shut down satellites and switch off power systems well ahead of it reaching the Earth. Hopefully, you know, we'll have that technology. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something uh, before in terms of uh, the knowledge being destroyed uh, roughly around the, you know, the fourth century or so. Um mm-hmm. But I, I'm personally also interested in in the the sun story, the store, the story of of the of the sun that was retold also by the um, ecumenical councils that were going on. We have the Constantine and the um, some some of the other uh, councils that, that were taking place in in terms of rewriting the story from of the old pagan world, um, a solar mythology, pretty much. And okay. applying that on to, on top of uh, of of Jesus, what, what what can you say about that story? That it, to, because to me it feels like we've still been given th- that story, the old story, but it's been even further veiled in in other terms, so to speak. Well, Emperor Constantine, he had a lot of a lot of strife and religious conflict within the Roman Empire, you know, particularly different sects of Christianity fighting with each other. Um, so when he called the Council of Nicaea, that was to, to, to set a standard, standardized religion. And I think the reason for setting Christ's birthday on the 25th of December, which was always the traditional birthday of the sun, and you can explain that in terms of the um, days lengthening again from that point, uh, a lot of that was just to make the pill easier to swallow, because... People didn't have to change their their celebration dates. 
and then a lot of the hero stories that were sort of you know long long ancient stories that attributed to different heroes were attributed to Jesus and the twelve disciples that you know a lot of other gods and sons of gods had and which relate to the constellations um a lot of that information was put in, and I can almost imagine them haggling over, you know, which story we're going to use and, and add to the Christ story to make this this pill easier to swallow. It's I don't know whether it was just you know practical bureaucracy trying to get a get a the most acceptable religion as possible, kind of like you know politi- politicians haggling over things. Mm. Um, or whether there was some undercurrent of ongoing solar worship, which the Masons and some people do. It's, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a tricky one. It's, it's obviously difficult for us to know that story, uh, what actually is true. But in any regard, we've still been given, I guess what I'm saying is we've still been given fragments uh, of the story and, and it continues to, to this day. And, and obviously for those who have the, uh, the right symbolic interpretation, or can apply that to to the story, will fairly soon realize that it's it's a story of the of the sun and not about a, a another another deity here. Well, there, there there's huge strife. I, I subscribe to Google Word Alerts, so every time Son of God or Sun God or Solar Worship comes up, I get notified, and it's almost always within religious forums where people are saying, you know, we shouldn't worship on Sundays and people are just talking about this evil solar worship ideas that crept into the church and accusing different people over it. Um, it's, it's very, you know, a lot, a lot of Christians are aware of that and they really resent it. They say that we shouldn't have this. Sun worship is evil. It's Satan worship. It's bad. Um, it's quite sad, and I mean, as you probably know, Emperor Constantine himself remained a sun worshiper throughout his life. Sure, he was baptized at his deathbed, and I suspect that one of the reasons, probably the main reason, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, wasn't because the emperors saw the light or understood the Gospels, but it was there's some really handy principles in there to instill in your population, like. Bless those who oppress you. Suffering is going to get you to heaven. Love your enemies. If somebody, you know, tries to take your coat, give him your tunic as well. It's all this sort of, you know, being oppressed and suffering is good for you. That will get you to heaven. That's right. And that's really handy. And I think the rest of it was just details. <laughs> well, that's a good point, and that that's uh, something that that seldom is, is addressed in that sense. It's all quite the opposite. It's almost seen as a uh, as as a virtue and and to to give up uh, all the things that that they took from you in that sense and and to be poor is a good thing etc. Well, the church obviously is one of the richest institutions in the world and have been for a long time, okay. and and at that time as well we obviously we're talking about a as you mentioned a transition time over from a a a, a pagan if you will then I mean there's other words for that but let's use it for now a, a pagan system over to Christianity and they. As you say, that they needed a, a good uh, version of this and, and a, a blending version, because if if it would have been too too much different from their own own religious system, they, they would never have adopted it. Um, and so they needed to kind of ease in this system, if you will, right? That's how I see it, anyway. Yeah, I agree with that completely. It's just, um, yeah, it was done. I think it was a sort of practical bureaucratic move, and they probably had no idea how. How much Christianity would still fragment after after they thought they'd set a standard template? It's just I, I forget how many branches of Christianity there are right now, but I think it goes into three figures. Uh, I think so. I've been heard up towards uh, three thousand or something like that. I might be wrong there, then, but there's incredible many denominations, as it were, of, of Christianity. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Uh, and w- what about if we go back to that idea of of um, the Satan worship and, and connection to, to, to the sun and all that as well. Today also we hear stories about uh, masonry, other esoteric groups, secret societies, the Illuminati, etc. as well, that they are also being obviously accused of being sun worshippers. We see these on, on logos, pyramids. Sun is one of the most prominent symbols there is out there, obviously. Um, is, is that an evil act or, or are they simply usur- usurping the, the, the sun 
uh, and using the energy that is behind that? Or, or what's your take on that? No, I, I would I would just say what you said that they are actually they're they're they are aware they're fully cognizant of the power of the sun, and they are using the energy from it, um, whether it's for good purposes or bad purposes. Um, but they're certainly not in any hurry to let the bulk of the population know about the nature of the sun and and what energy and power you can get from it, because that's part of their secret society. Now that that might be evil, but knowing about the nature of the sun isn't. And and people often sort of put down uh, Masons because they worship the sun or they see the sun as a god. Um, I don't really know how or to what degree that is true, but in and of itself, that's that's nothing wrong with it. Uh, Also, on top of that, we hear stories about uh, rituals that are being done on sun or uh, solstice points and things like that, because the energy of the sun is is at, at as most strong at that point, obviously. So you can actually, in that sense, work with the sun. Again, this could be from the point of view that you mentioned, uh, Gregory, from a negative point of view or a positive point of view. But there seems to be an an a mass at at that point as well. I mean, this year, for instance, at the at the solstice, I was watching some footage from uh, Stonehenge and, and other places around the world and it's a lot of people are obviously they're they're in tune to that now for, for you know for whatever reason and and they're working with those energy but energies but do you think that that's that's the the, the, the truth of, of the matter then in that sense that, that that is solstice points across equinox points that's a really um, good opportunity to so to speak to actually enforce your will or to work with this energy that is coming from the sun at those at those times yeah those those are definitely definitely key points but you know the sun is there every day That's and, right. um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I actually discovered uh, the practice of sun gazing after i'd written my book and it was actually that was when i was 18 years old and first recognized it as a uh, as as an entity that I, I did I did sun gazing. I've stared into it for about twenty minutes in, in this epiphany moment of mine, and um, I've never been able to do that since. Um, but I since then learned about the technique of sun gazing, and there there are there's a way of going about it. And there are times of day when you do it, and you certainly don't do it when the sun's high in the sky. That's right. Yeah. But I've um I've managed about sort of half a dozen really good sun gazing sessions over the last year. And they really are empowering. It really is a strengthening, a strengthening practice. I mean, we we know obviously vitamin D is created by, you know, when the sun hits our, our skin yeah. and so forth. A uh, lot of good things come 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 from the sun in that sense. But how how do you maybe you can tell a little bit more uh, to our listeners here in terms of sun gazing? You could, as you said, you could even damage your optical nerve if you do it at the at the wrong time, right? So there's yeah. a few procedures you need to to be aware of. Yeah, well, one, one, obviously you can, I, mean, I actually have a chapter in my book, which was as far as I got on sun gazing, and it's called Say Hello Back, um, which sug- advises you to, uh, with your eyes shut, look straight directly at the sun and just absorb absorb the rays, feel the light going through your body, breathe the light in. Um, and that's that's a really nice practice because you're getting vibrations from the sun because the light that's hitting us is actual vibrations coming from a living being. Um, and just being cognizant of that changes changes the nature of your reception of them and sends vibrations back to the sun at the same time. Um, I mean, I'm, I make the point that however bright the lights are in a room, when you go into a room and switch the lights on, you don't suddenly feel good because of that bright light. You might feel like you're being interrogated. Same same if you're um you know going under a sunbed. It doesn't make you feel good. But something about a sunny day makes everybody feel better. And that's because that's the vibration coming through. Um but now with the sun gazing, again that was a one hour lecture and I don't really want to be responsible for anybody damaging their eyes, but but you really should never need to be squinting it should never hurt your eyes or feel like you're blinding yourself i mean we're we're human beings i mean you you go up to a flame you know how far you can get before you're going to burn your fingers that's right and you pull back in time 
and the same is the sort of basic underlying principle with sun gazing. Um, I started off looking at, I mean, you're, the times are supposed to be just for, for the first hour after sunrise and an hour before sunset, and the closer to the rise or the set, the easier it is. And when it's sunset, you can usually look at the sun directly just before it hits the horizon. It's an orange ball. Um, but I've also sort of looked just below it, just, you know, as, as far below it as I can without having to squint, just to get your eyes used to it. Um, and when you are actually able to look straight at it, uh, there's no squinting, there's no sort of dark spots in your eye afterwards, but you should start out, you know, not for more, you know, a few seconds at a time and then build it up till you can get to minutes. Also, I look at it sometimes if the cloud is just right, the right thickness of cloud, you can see the shape of the sun behind it. Sometimes uh, reflected through water, um, you can you can sun gaze through the water at the sun safely or across a window. But sometimes even off of water, it's too bright or, or, or in a reflection, it's too bright. Hmm. But it's, it's a key thing of making sure that you're not squinting, you know, listen, listen to your body when you do it. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk more with you, uh, Gregory, obviously here in our second hour, and I think it's a good time to uh, take a little break here. But why don't you uh, mention your websites, obviously, and when people can go to uh, pick up a copy of your book. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the book is called Son of God, S-U-N, of course, and I spell God with a capital zero to differentiate it from anything biblical and to imply the oneness. The website, I've got two websites. One is GregorySams.com, that's S-A-M-S, and the other is SonOfGod.net. Um, and both of those, you know, link to each other, but the SonOfGod.net is just a, a teaser about the book. And GregorySams.com has my entire previous book online, plus a lot of other interesting stuff and a fractal gallery. Now, clean, clean head slate. Is this a uh, pointless bowl of gas that we we happen to be benefiting from, or is it some? Is it a life form that is actually playing a part in shaping and managing the environment around it? And you know, the more likely choice is the latter one that it's that it is a living being. And um, the unlikely one is that this is all just a, a ball of gas. Hmm. So what do you think? The, how, how would you explain the consciousness itself of, of the sun? Is it, is, it, um, is it as a human being is consciousness in that sense that it is uh, rapid? In that sense, we, we can see time progress and, and things like that. Or is it, is it on another level? It's maybe of a, a type of consciousness that we would have very difficult to 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 understand maybe it's it's um it's slower in one sense i mean we can even if we look at uh, some of the things that nasa has released uh some of these audio signals that they speed up you can almost hear planets uh, emit sounds almost like waves actually but these are very extremely low frequency so actually if you compress it or speed it up rather you can hear it's like whale song similar to their sounds like the action of community gregory why don't we begin to talk a little bit about the concept of the of the sun then in terms of your new book that you have out now um what got you interested in in looking at the sun uh, as i understand it obviously you're looking at this from a point of view that the sun actually is a conscious uh being but overall people who listen to this program will be aware that the sun is is something we've been focusing on now because it's it is starting to get a different behavior uh, if you know what I mean, it, it's we're yeah. waiting for a storm, a sunstorm, something to happen on the sun. Uh, but what, what got you interested in in uh, in this uh, theory, uh, Gregory? Well, I I recognized back when I was 18 years old in Berkeley, California. Um, I had this sort of epiphany moment where I recognized that the sun was not some dead ball of gas; that there was a living being there. Um, I never did anything with it, though. I never really talked about it, except when people started talking about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and I couldn't restrain myself from pointing out all this technology and you know, things going on whilst we're oblivious to the smartest thing in our little nook, nook of the woods, which is our sun. 
But I, as, as I said, I never really did anything. Isn't that always uh, what it what it's about? Someone need to spearhead and and uh, break through the ice, so to speak, and bring new ideas to the to the surface. That has always been the case, right? That's right. Yeah, um, and it's always been you know, not accepted at the beginning. Whatever whatever the sort of established theory is, it it meets ridicule at first because that's how we treat unfamiliar things generally. Absolutely. Uh, so how how did you go about? Um, tackling this 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 issue, this topic, uh, did you come to it from a point of view that okay, I need to actually prove scientifically that the sun is alive, or or, or is it enough, so to speak, to to uh, approach the topic from the point of view of uh, of how the the ancient people viewed the sun and, and how and their relationship uh, to the sun? Yeah, well, I, I suppose I, I call myself a bootstrap philosopher. Um, I'm not a scientist. But I, in the course of writing the book, I looked into the science of it quite a bit. And, you know, the first thing we have to recognize is that it wasn't science that told us sun worship is primitive and ignorant. It was the church, and, and the church burned people who disagreed with them for, for many centuries. And that has a, you know, a very strong shaping impact on the culture. And um, thing with it, I ran quite a few businesses involved with natural foods, and I opened a shop related to, dedicated to chaos theory. Um, I wrote my first book, and then as I was beginning work on my second book, I, I sort of honed it down to a, a chosen sort of subject I wanted to write about. But I got into topic drip, and I drift, and I started writing about the sun and about the fact that. Not primitive people, but ancient people, you know, very civilized people, pre-Christianity, all saw the sun as a living being. And I went off on that tangent and I suddenly realized, well, this is actually the stone I want to uncover, or the biggest elephant in the room. And, um, and a very important book to write because I've always liked doing things that are quite new to the culture, but obvious once you give them a little bit of thought. My first one was the the relationship between diet and health, because in 1967, when you told people that what you ate affected your health, they looked at you like you were a nutter. You know, where's this guy coming from? Um, now people say, well, of course. What do you mean? <laughs> right. But there was about you know 15, 20 years of work changing that that attitude. What? So I'm kind of rewind back to a point before the Old Testament was sort of mandated in in the fourth century AD mm. and um, and look at the you know, look at the Sun look at solar science from the viewpoint of somebody who recognizes or thinks that the Sun is a living being and it it just so much of what we know about the Sun today fits with that and when you understand the complexity of that um of the sun and, and of stars in general i mean the sun itself has seven different layers inside the sun some of the layers turn at different speeds to each other it's got a magnetic field the corona that's much bigger than itself it has a magnetic field the heliosphere that embraces all the planets protects them from being blown apart eventually by high impact cosmic high energy cosmic rays um it interacts with all those planets so there are auroras on every planet in the solar system when the sun's magnetic field meets theirs and as you sort of I'm going to go into that more later on but when you stack all this up and you say well okay 